Hello and welcome to Data Science for Ecologists in R. Today we will finally start talking about statistical models for our data. The simplest tool at hand is the so-called linear model, which will be our topic today. In the next couple of videos we will focus on some theoretical properties of the model. This is important because a basic understanding of the model is crucial for properly using the tools provided by R and interpreting the output correctly. Let's start with the simple linear model which is given by this equation right here. The variable y is often referred to as the outcome variable. x is used in the calculation of y, so the exact value of y can be partly explained by the value of x. Therefore, we call x the explanatory variable. Beta 1 determines how much x is weighted in this calculation, which is why we call beta 1 the weight. Beta 0 is called the intercept, which will become clear in a minute when you consider a small example. Looking at the equation, we immediately see one assumption made by the model namely that there is a linear relationship between x and y. However, this relationship is not deterministic since an error term epsilon is added. This error term is assumed to follow a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance sigma squared. Moreover, the error terms for different observations are assumed to be independent of each other. Let's now look at a simple example to illustrate which data structure is implied by these model assumptions. More specifically, we will consider a simple linear model with beta 0 equals 3 and beta 1 equals 0 0.5, where the error term is normally distributed with mean 0 and variance 4. Since y is calculated based on the value of x, we now need some x values. For the sake of this example, let's look at 20 evenly spread x values between 0 0.5 and 10. So we have x1 equals 0 0.5, x2 equals 1, x3 equals 1.5, and so on up until x20 equals 10. To represent these different observations in the model equation, we usually add a subscript i to all variables. The i is simply a placeholder for the different observations. For example, we can calculate y1, the y value of the first observation, by plugging in the x value of the first observation, which is 0 0.5. This way we can calculate all y values and obtain this getter plot right here, where the underlying linear relationship is indicated by the black line. We can see that the line intercepts the y-axis at 3, which is the reason why we call beta 0 the intercept. Let's now look at x equals 2 to see exactly how the corresponding y-value is computed. We first compute 3 plus 0 0.5 times 2, which is 4, so that we land on the line. From there we randomly sample epsilon from a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 4. In this specific case, we sampled an epsilon value of around 2, and by adding this value to 4, we arrive at our observed y value. Ok, I hope this nicely illustrates the linear relationship and normally distributed errors. What might not be clear immediately is that the errors in this dataset were also sampled independently of each other. To understand this, let's look at the two data points circled in red. One might think that the corresponding errors are not independent because they have approximately the same value. However, we know that the errors are in fact normally distributed random variables and the values that we observe are only individual samples. So let's draw another sample for the same x values. You can see that this time the two errors are not similar and if we kept repeating this process again and again, we would see that there is no systematic covariation between these errors. Of course the two values may happen to be similar, as we have just seen, but in general there is no tendency for this. This is what is meant with independence. Alright, this concludes our small example, which was designed to illustrate the assumptions of the linear model. In this example, we generated data according to a predefined linear model, which might seem a bit artificial. I mean, in practice, we are usually not interested in generating data according to a model, but we already have some data at hand and want to learn something about it. Nevertheless, it is essential to think about your data as the result of some true data generating process. To understand what I mean, let's assume that we actually have this dataset at hand, which contains age and height information of German children. If we now think that our data can be explained in terms of a linear model, then strictly speaking, we believe that our observed height values are the result of the calculation process described earlier. This means we believe each height value is the result of a true underlying linear trend plus a normally distributed error term with fixed variance. The underlying linear trend reflects the true relationship between age and height, while the error term captures deviations from the general trend, for example due to individual differences in genetic or nutritional factors. 
So for the same age values, there are in theory infinitely many possible heights because of the error term, which means there are also infinitely many possible samples, of which I depicted 4 here. We should regard our sample as one of these infinitely many possible samples. This way of thinking about the data will become essential later when we use a sample to make inferences about the parameters of the linear model. Finally, it should be emphasized that the idealized assumptions we illustrated are certainly never perfectly fulfilled in practice. Nevertheless, the linear model can be a good approximation of reality in some cases. For the normal distribution, we already learned why this is the case in the last video. To conclude this video, I want to present the general formulation of the linear model. So far, we only considered one explanatory variable, but we can easily expand the simple model to include multiple explanatory variables. Remember that in case of the simple linear model with n observations, we use this notation. We could now go ahead and add a 1 as an additional subscript to x to indicate that this is our first explanatory variable. Note that this new subscript matches the subscript of the corresponding weight beta 1. If we want to include a second explanatory variable in our model, I hope it is quite intuitive that we add beta 2 times xi2. And in the same way we can formulate a linear model with an arbitrary number of explanatory variables. Of course, everything we will learn in this series also applies to this general case. However, we will always use the simple linear model for illustration purposes. Alright, that's it for today. See you in the next video, where we will continue talking about the linear model.